So I've got 40 minutes, actually probably about 38 minutes and 30 seconds now um, to go through this presentation. Um, First of all, I run something called MapCamp, by the way, where we uh, have mappers from all over the world. Mapping is used to save huge amounts of money in governments and big Silicon Valley companies. It's also used to save lives. Um, but one of the things that we do with MapCamp is we do environmental sponsorship. So um, just a huge call out to uh, Barry and Charlie, who were just on stage, if you just missed them, who were talking about the whole Parkinson's disease and, and, and the, the trust fund around that. So I just want to say, if they're still in the audience, thank you very much and give a big round to them. Right, so introduction to orderly mapping. How many of you have heard of my form of mapping before? Wow, about, uh, about a third, fantastic. So I'm gonna start off um, with the issue of strategy. I'm gonna start at the very beginning where mapping came from, then we're heading south. Uh, I will talk about maps. I will talk about being trapped by context. Afterwards, I'll talk about patterns. And depending upon how much time we have left, we might get into serverless and other things that go wrong. OK, and things like how DevOps is the new legacy and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, can you hear me OK at the background? Yeah. Right, super. So let's start with uh, the issue of strategy. For me, this started with this company, for Tango, online photo service, uh, 16 different lines of uh, business, many millions of users. Uh, this was about 2003, 2004, very profitable, revenue growing, but it had a problem. And that problem was this person. This was our CEO. <laughs> and our CEO was a fake CEO. They didn't know what they were doing. They were making it up as they went along. Now, I know this because I was the CEO. <laughs> okay, we, we had like statements like this, our strategy is customer focus, we will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. This was 2003. Uh, but I'd simply pinched this from another company and just changed a few words. <laughs> So I was a little bit worried people would rumble that I was clueless. So I used to go around with a tape recorder recording other CEOs talking about strategy. And I used to record the short words they used. I called them business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blahs for short. And these are the sort of common blahs. They do this every few years. Um, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage, ecosystem, blah, blah, blah. If I did it today, what words would you hear? Same ones. Same ones. Any, any additional new ones? AI, yes, right, AI. Any others? Blockchain, yes, you can't do anything without a bit of blockchain. Yes, 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 you would have that. So then I grabbed a whole bunch of company strategy documents together, created what I call the Blah template. So our strategy is Blah, we will lead a Blah effort of the market through our use of Blah and Blah to build a Blah. Then I combined the Blahs and Blah templates together, smashed them together, and auto-generated 64 random strategies. <laughs> Things like this. Our strategy is customer focused. We will lead a, a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Oh, here, have money. Um, <laughs> and things like this. Our strategy is innovative digital business. We, oh, anyway, they're, they're just too painful. So I sent them around. I got 400 responses back, three basic types. Number one was, this is the exact wording from our business plan. <laughs> Number two was, I've seen two of these used already. And the third of my favorite was, are you for hire? <laughs> so anyway, a friend of mine's put this all online. Uh, this is strategy as a service. So if you, if, you <laughs> if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. It will automatically generate you one based upon nothing whatsoever. <laughs> If you wish, you can pretend there's a bit of an AI and blockchain behind it if it makes you feel comfortable. Um, so our strategy is collaborative. We will lead an open F. Anyway, if you don't like it, pretty simple. Just press refresh. <laughs> Saves a fortune in consultancy fees. Anyway, um, so I started to think, oh, god, there must be more to this subject than this. So I started reading, and I'm just getting nowhere. And then in a bookstore, a bookseller said, have you read Sun Tzu? And I went, no, who's that? He said, well, you need to take two copies of the book because they're all translations. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? 
The Art of War. So it was in the second translation I noticed something about the two books. Sun Tzu talks about five factors that mattered in competition. One, have a purpose, your moral imperative. Two, understand the landscape you're competing in. Three, understand the climactic patterns, so how the landscape is changing. Four, understand doctrine and principles of organization. Finally, you get into the leadership bit. I was quite excited by that. And then I came across John Boyd. Anybody heard of John Boyd? OODA loops, perfect. So a US Air Force pilot, so you have the game, your purpose. The first O is to observe the environment, which is what landscape and climactic patterns are about. Then you orient yourself around it. That's what doctrine and principles are around. And then you decide where you're going to attack and then you act. I was quite excited. So I showed this to other people and they would go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Strategy is all about the importance of why. But the problem with that statement is there are two whys. There's the why of purpose and the why of movement. And they are very different things. Anybody play chess? A few. Right. So your why of purpose might be to win the game. Your why of movement is do I move this piece or that piece? And it's through movement and action that we actually learn. So we learn things like fool's mate. Assuming we can perceive the environment. And it's a cycle. And the more you go around this, the better you get at playing this game. Now, here's the problem. Um, if you can't see the landscape, you can't determine climactic patterns, you can't all you're left with is purpose, gut feel, and action, which is how I ended up with this as my strategy document. Well, this is actually number two of the 64, but it was close enough. Right, so I then got into how do I understand the landscape I'm competing in? And that led me on to the subject of maps. So why maps? Right, this is a map of a, of a Roman city. There's about 20 points of interest, uh, five residential areas, and five military points of interest as well, military areas. Um, if you try to describe every journey going from A to B and back again with 25 words, that simple diagram, just simple paths, A to B, would be about 870 paths, that's 20,000 words. If you try to describe every combination, that's approximately that number of Wikipedias. That's a lot, okay? Um, and that doesn't even cope with the fact that you can go and explore. So go off the beaten path. So the thing about maps is they're great ways of condensing information. Uh, they're powerful ways of exploring and expla explaining a landscape more than stories are. But I still use stories for the simple things, like uh, to get to the temple, take a left at the Colosseum. Uh, but the problem with a story is if you disagree with my story, I get very angry at you. Arr, what do you mean you, uh, my story is wrong? Um, in fact, we do this in business a lot because we tell everybody to be a good leader, you need to be a great storyteller. Okay, so it's not the story is ever wrong, it's that you failed as a storyteller. Okay, and if only you were a better storyteller. So when you challenge somebody's story, they get very upset. Whereas with a map, if I said to get to the Colosseum, go this way, I can go, well, we can go that way. And we have less of that sort of argument because now we're fighting over a map, not the story and not the person. So maps are also powerful ways of depersonalizing and taking the politics out of discussion. So what is a map? Right, Folkestone, London, Dover, M M2, M20, 115, 124 kilometers. Roughly how far from Folkestone to Dover, do you think? Yeah, it's about uh, 12 kilometers. Right, because this is a graph. This is not a map, OK? <laughs> um, these are two identical graphs. They're exactly the same. OK, now I'm going to do something magical. Watch closely. These are two different maps. Did you see what I did? Let me do it again. <laughs> oh, did you see what I did? Yes, I added a compass, OK? And the difference between a graph and a map is basically space has meaning. So when you move a piece, it changes the meaning of a map in a way it doesn't in a graph. And because space has meaning, it means we can go and explore. 
So what do we have in business? I had loads of maps in business. I had mind maps. I had business process maps. I had systems maps, loads of them. So I've taken a system map that we had, customer, photo storage, website, CRM. I've shaded this box, CRM, and I'm just going to move it. Now, how's the map changed? Any ideas? Right, if I take an atlas and I move Sydney and put it next to uh, <laughs> London, does the map change? Yes. Right, has it changed here? No. Why not? Because it's a graph. Because it's a graph, not a map. The, the one amusing thing is all the things that we call maps in business tend to have one thing in common. Do you know what it is? Graphs. They're not maps, they're, they're graphs. <laughs> I'm afraid we keep using that word and it doesn't mean what we think it means. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, and of course, without maps, we're back to gut fill and we're back to this sort of stuff. So what? We survive. I used to think, it doesn't matter, I don't have a map. Neither does... Who cares? I'm still successful. Well, business is a cat fight. And it's okay to be completely blind to the environment as long as everybody else is. It's all right to be useless, just as long as all your competitors are, then no one gains an advantage. Now, there's this wonderful study, it's not very popular. Marcus Fitzer, use of variance decomposition into the impacts of CEOs, looks at about 13,000 CEOs, worked out their impact on the organization was indistinguishable from random charts, which basically means you can take your board, just throw them out, get some people off the street, not a problem at all. It's probably why it's not a very popular paper. Now, just to emphasize this problem, this is Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem. Persians were invading. 140,000 to 170,000 Persians. We're not quite sure. Uh, what he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along coastal road into Thermopylae, where a small number of troops, there were 4,000 Greeks, could defend against a larger force. Now, there were 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans, right. So I want you to imagine you're part of the Athenian city-state. It's the eve of battle. I am Themistocles. I am giving you purpose and moral imperative. And then I say to you, I do not understand the landscape. I do not understand the environment. I have no map, but have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> Strengths, a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians, get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian, we hate the Spartans. And threats is the, uh, the Persians get rid of us, oh, bad. And the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? Position and movement described by a map or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram? <laughs> what would you use? A map. Right, what do we use in business? SWOT. SWOT, excellent, fantastic. So how do you map a business since we so insist on using graphs? Well, a map has certain characteristics. You have an anchor, you have the position of pieces relative to an anchor, and you have consistency of movement. So if I want to go from Thebes to Thermopylae, which direction would I go? Northwest. If I go northwest from Thebes and end up in Athens, what does that tell me? <laughs> or the compass is wrong. The map's upside down or the compass is wrong. One of those two. Okay. So I took a systems diagram. I said, we need an anchor. So I put the user at the top. We could have many anchors. We could have the business, regulators. We can have the users. Now, well, that's my, my uh, uh, anchor. Those users have needs. So in my case, they needed online image manipulation, online photo storage, printing out pictures. So they had needs. But those things also had needs. So what we can do is build a chain of needs. A website needs a runtime, needs compute, needs a data center, needs power. So I've got an anchor. So I haven't got position, though. Well, fortunately, a user using your website, that's more visible to them than the power you power your compute in your data center, which is used underneath the website is. So you can use, think of visibility like distance. This is near to them, that is far. And so what we can do is do a partial ordered chain of needs. And I just put this axis on the side. It's completely, you know, it's just there as training wheels, really, scaffolding. 
Uh, it just means that as you go down, the stuff at the bottom is less visible than the stuff higher up to the people higher up. Right, so I've got anchor and position. I'm missing movement. Well, it turns out that capital evolves through a common pattern. So you get the genesis of uh, novel and new things, custom-built examples, then you get products and rental services, and eventually commodity and utility services. And that's all driven by supply and demand competition. So what I can do is I, I, I can just put this in where it needs to be, and now I've got position and movement, I've got an anchor, and this is a map, and that was the first map I produced in 2005, 14 years ago. Okay, who cares? What does that matter? Very simple diagrams, don't take much effort at all. Um, one of our biggest problems is we're trapped by context. So I'll give you um, so many examples of this. I'll give you one from an insurance company. I'm not picking on particular insurance, so if you want terrible. Now, government, by the way, is nowhere near as wasteful as the private sector. You want to go and have a look at banks. I mean, horrendous. <laughs> anyway, so um, they had a process flow. They needed compute. So they needed compute, order a server, um, and the server comes into goods in, they modify mount and rack it. And they had a bottleneck here in terms of the modifications and mounting. Uh, so they came up with a plan to invest in robotics to get rid of the bottleneck to make this process flow more efficient. Uh, they spent about six months, put a business case together. About $2 million of investment, return on investment sub one year, all this sort of stuff. Lots of SWOT diagrams, fantastic. Um, the problem is, if I start to challenge that story, they were like, oh, we need robots. Uh, so I asked them, could you just spend 15 minutes and let's just quickly map it? Remember, they'd spent six months on this. Okay. They started off with the user needs compute. They put computing product. I might disagree, but okay. They went order server, server goods in, all very commodity. And then they went rack, mount, modify. I'm going to leave that there just for about 30 seconds. Anybody notice anything odd? Custom built racks, yes. I said, why have you got rack in custom built? And they said, oh, we have our own racks. What do you mean? We have a company who make our racks for us. Ah. What are the modifications you're making to servers then? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, they don't fit into our racks. <laughs> so we have to take the cases off and draw new holes, add new plates in order to get them to fit into the racks. Ah, and that's why you need robotics, yes. <laughs> At this point, people are going, ah. <laughs> Anybody got another solution? Use standard racks, okay? Uh, this is what we call evolutionary flow, taking out the custom build and using more commodity where it's available. Um, what, and it's, this is probably one of the most common problems I see, and I see billions spent on this, is people optimizing process flows which are totally ineffective. Okay, they're making the ineffective far more efficient. Uh, where, in fact, what they should just be doing is using standard racks. And, of course, once you do that, you can say, well, compute. We're an insurance company. Really? Come on, that should be over here. We should be more using cloud. That's the process flow we want. Do we want to invest in robotics? What do you think? No. Another example, um, digital weighing scales. So a particular department, it's all about weighing scales. Uh, they were really into, you know, we need digital transformation because they were quite traditional in, in, in the sense. And what they mean by that is they're actually an agency for another department and they report once a month a figure. And that figure comes from weighing machines. Um, and what, which is weighing paper forms. So we produce so many paper forms, it's actually cheaper to weigh them up uh, to count the number. Right? So you weigh the, how many forms, you use an algorithm to work out how many forms rather than physically count them. And that's the figure they report back once a month. And of course, very manual process, so they wanted to use brand new spanking digital scales uh, in connected to their system. Make it better, sounds sensible. All right, so that's where they started. And I said, well, do you mind if I just have a little bit of a look? And they went, OK. So I said, where are the paper forms coming from? And they said they come from Goods Inn. So I walked down to Goods Inn and say, where are you getting your paper forms from? Oh, we're getting them from distribution sites all over the country. They're pretty standardized. Ah, oh, OK. So I went to visit a distribution site. Where are you getting your paper forms from? Oh, we're printing them out. Right, you're printing out the paper forms, yes, which you're then sending to this other group. Right, and where are you printing them out from? Oh, from our website. Our users fill it on online, and it goes into our CRM system, and then you print out the paper forms, yes, and you send this to this other group, yes. Do you know what they do with them? No, they weigh them. <laughs> <laughs> to work out how many you've printed out. And we've got distribution sites all over the country. 
Now, all of this stuff can be replaced with select count staff and table. <laughs> now, it's not that people are daft. It's just they're trapped by context, OK? So does digital weighing scales make sense there? No, of course it doesn't. But the problem is people get trapped, so they're trying to make it efficient at the top, and they're trying to make it efficient in terms of printing forms out the bottom. When you look at the whole thing, it's a horror show. So then we get into patterns. So once you start learning about the landscape and challenging others, et cetera, and questioning why we do stuff, you start to learn patterns like climactic patterns and doctrine, and eventually you get into gameplay, ways of manipulating the market. So climactic patterns are rules that influence the game. Simple things like you've got a map, everything will evolve, supply and demand competition. It will evolve. It's a product now, it becomes a commodity. Another pattern you learn is we have inertia to that change because of pre-existing capital. About 16 different forms of inertia. That can be really troublesome. Blockbuster, Netflix, who was first with a website? Blockbuster, who was first with video ordering online? Blockbuster, who was first with video streaming experiments? Blockbuster, who went bankrupt first? <laughs> Why? They out-innovated everyone. So how did they go bankrupt? The CEO. Hmm? The CEO, like you. Well, yeah, the CEO didn't know what they were doing, yeah. No, it's pre-existing business model. Absolutely, yeah, so the CEO, just like me. Um, it was late fees. You remember late fees? You remember? I'm getting, well, one of these days I'm going to say this and somebody's going to go, what's a video cassette recorder? <laughs> do, you, do you remember video cassette recorders and how you always promised to bring them back and you always forgot? Right, that's where they made most of their money. And you don't get that in streaming. So despite they out-innovated everybody else, that's what hit them. The next thing you learn is that as things evolve and become more efficient, they enable higher order systems to appear. So electricity as a utility enables radio, television, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's componentization, Herbert Simon's theory of hierarchy. Pretty basic stuff. Now, we call this new area the adjacent unexplored. All exciting, all sort of new stuff. We don't know what's going to see, succeed, so ear be dragons, OK? Now, what also happens is those higher order systems create new industries of worth or value. So you don't know whether it's going to be the box which does pictures or whether it's going to be the refrigeration blanket. I mean, back then I would have gone refrigeration blanket. Everybody's going to want one of those. Turns out it was the box with moving pictures. but. Uh, what you get is higher order systems, and they create new industries, Hollywood, television, media, et cetera. OK, now the point about this is I can take a map, I can apply common economic patterns, and now I can see where to invest. Do I want to differentiate? Do I want to invest in runtime becoming a utility, or computers a utility, or wait till somebody else does the game and build on top? And this was our discussion in 2005. I thought it was going to be Google doing this bit. Turned out it was Amazon next year. But why not invest here? Well, this stuff is behind these inertia barriers. So I might think I want to do that because it improves process flow. But the one, the first rule you learn, manage the evolutionary flow before you manage the process flow. So that's what we did. We launched, uh, we used this. We anticipated someone would play a utility game. So we built the first, uh, what is now called a serverless environment, uh, JavaScript front and back end, billing per, func per function. Uh, we launched it in 2006. Um, Amazon then launched, so we repositioned our system on top of Amazon. Uh, this was Zimkey, grew like hotcakes. And so we had three projects going on through mapping, uh, 3D printing, use of mobile phones as cameras, and, and this uh, the, the, well, platform, it was serverless actually, uh, cloud stuff. And that was growing like hotcakes. And then we had the big expensive management consultants come in and explain to our parent company, you're getting it all wrong. The future is 3D TV. So we shut it all down, spent a billion dollars on 3D TV. Anybody have a 3D TV here? <laughs> Do you use it? No. Anybody use one? Anybody use cloud? <laughs> Mobile phone as a camera. <laughs> 3D printing. Yeah, you can, you can see I, I, I'm not a big fan of US-based large consultancy strategy firms. Anyway, um, so it didn't matter. Um, I had a map. 
and we'd learned how to map and use maps, and I thought everybody else in the world was doing this at that time, and it took me many, many years to discover they weren't, so I, I used the techniques at Ubuntu. Uh, anybody know who, what Ubuntu is? Yes? Right, so we mapped out the environment in 2008. Um, we were about 2 to 3% of the operating system market. We used the map to attack the space. It cost me half a million. We were up against my, uh, Microsoft and Red Hat to take 70% of all cloud in 18 months. Does anybody remember that 2008 to 2010, where Ubuntu was like, you'd not heard of it, and then suddenly it was everywhere? Thank you. You were mapped. <laughs> Uh, and then I wrote something called The Better for Less, which led to things like spin control and so forth, and helped in the formation of something called Government Digital Services. I worked with a chap called Liam Maxwell and others on the paper. I used uh, a lot of mapping in government. And these days, mapping has spread to things like the UN, even into academic papers. Uh, LSC has got this paper on building situational awareness in, in the age of ecosystems. All right. So another set of patterns uh, to talk about a doctrine. So these are universally applicable patterns. There are about 30 uh, climactic patterns you use for anticipation. Most people are oblivious to all of this. Uh, there's 40 of these doctrines. So these are universally useful principles. Um, so just to explain a couple, as things evolve, they become more efficient, and then they enable higher order systems to appear, which then evolve. And as these things evolve, their characteristics change. So they start off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, and ultimately become industrialized, ordered, known, measured, stable, standard, and dull. Doesn't matter whether it's money or computing or penicillin, okay? Um, now, because of this, we'd gone all agile, <laughs> as in extreme programming, uh, from Kent Beck's a, uh, a friend. Uh, we, we, we'd done that in 2002, 2003. And of course, by 2004, we worked out it doesn't work everywhere. Um, so agile in-house development is very good on the left-hand side of the map because it reduces the cost of change and changes the norm. Six Sigma is strong on the right-hand side because it's about reducing deviation. And it turns out lean's good in the middle because it's about reducing waste. So you need multiple methods, i.e. there's no one-size-fits-all. Uh, but if you say not agile everywhere these days, people go burn him heretic. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, I, I used to say this like 10 years ago at Six Sigma conferences, and it was burn him heretic. It's, it's all the same. And it's the same with purchasing. Time, material, outcome, cots fixed, unit utility. There's, there's not one purchasing mechanism. So I'll give you an example. HS2 high-speed rail, James Finley, CIO. Um, this is building HS2 in a virtual world, because it turns out if you dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we got that wrong, it's cheaper than digging up the English countryside. So they decided to build the entire railway in a virtual world. So this is the systems diagram for it. Big problem, should I outsource it all? Should I use off-the-shelf products? Should I build it in-house with agile techniques? Or should I use some combination of all three? Now, the problem with the combination of all three is there are about 387 million permutations on that one single diagram alone. So which one do I pick? Uh, so James was having a cup of tea on a Sunday in his garden, drew a map, sent it to me, we refined it, that's what the map looks like, and now it's easy. You outsource the stuff on the right, you build uh, with off-the-shelf products in the middle, and you build agile in-house techniques on the left. All right? You use multiple techniques. He ended up in front of the public accounts committee because they were head of schedule, under budget. It was amazing. And, uh, and then they had a new chief exec who found it all too complex. So anyway, um, so James is, I'll tell you what James is doing these days. Uh, quite fun anyway. Um, so you use a map and use multiple methods on it. Now, vendors hate this, by the way, if you do this. Uh, vendors would prefer you not to break it down into components, uh, um, but in fact to just treat it all as one thing, like you outsource it all. And the reason why they want you to do that, uh, so I've taken a map and I've said we'll outsource it all, is because because you being good people want to have a specification document because you want to know what's being delivered. All right? Well, that's fine for the stuff over here which is well understood, well defined, and so it can be defined and efficiently delivered. But what's going to happen to the stuff over here? Do you remember I said it's more chaotic, uncertain? It's going to change. And therefore, you are going to be hammered with excessive change control costs. It's basically a scam. <laughs> and um, 
It's great. Because when the problem occurs, and you're saying, why is my 200 million pound project cost 600 million? I go, it's all your fault. What do you mean it's all my fault? Well, all the bits that were delivered efficiently uh, uh, are the bits that you didn't change your mind on. It's all the bits that you kept on changing your mind on that cost the money, so it's all your fault. Well, the joke, of course, is you couldn't actually specify those bits in the first place. You should have used a different method. Now, the worst case scenario is when somebody on your own team suddenly goes, next time we need to spend it, specify it better. Now you are doomed, <laughs> OK? Uh, you, are, you are putty in the hands of people who want to exploit you. Um, so remember, think small, break things down, use appropriate methods. Uh, James, by the way, has gone on use mapping at the RNLI. They've got the call out times from about 12 minutes down to 18 seconds. What that means is when you fall in the Thames, rather than them turning up and dragging out a dead body, they're actually saving lives. So, so good old James. Uh, so quick practice. Anybody from finance here? Yes? Is it fair to say that a lot of IT is a bit elvish? As a different language? Yes? Right, we'll take that analogy. Good. We're going to do a self-driving car in elvish. So I'm going to be IT and you're all going to be finance. So I'm going to give you a systems diagram, all in Elvish. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask you questions. Should we outsource or build our own? A, B, what do you think? Go on, give us some response. I, we want to collaborate. We want to work together. We want to get alignment. A, should we outsource or build our own? What do you think? Get some consultants to tell you at huge amounts of money. How's that going to help you? Right, OK. <laughs> Anybody else? Any, any more sensible suggestions? Uh, outsource it to someone who can translate Elvish. Uh, outsource it to someone who can translate Elvish. OK, fine. Right, I'm going to give you exactly the same systems diagram, but now as a map. <laughs> All right? So, should we outsource or build in-house B? Build in-house. In should we outsource or build in-house A? Simple. I haven't even translated it back into English, and we're now actually able to work together. So at this point, somebody goes, oh, it doesn't matter, Agile will evolve to be everywhere, because you know, this happens with Six Sigma. And I will talk about social practice theory and Elizabeth Show. Uh, well worth reading this stuff. So um, I said the line on the, uh, the, the value chain axis was scaffolding, training wheels. I'm going to take it away. Agile as a method has evolved. And it's very good at building things in that stage of evolution. But those things, whatever they are, also evolve. And Lean has evolved to become very good at dealing with the stuff in the middle. And Six Sigma has evolved to become very good at dealing with the stuff at the right. So what you've got are multiple meanings of the term project methodology. And these are different competences of project methodology. They're all project methodology. They're just different competences. And this thing, whatever it is, has a meaning, but it has different material. So what I mean by that is that is not the same as that is not the same as that. So the first ever computer is not like servers as a product, is not like servers as a utility. And what you've got are different competences are good, uh, different material. Make sense? Good, right. So what we try and do is make one competence work everywhere. <laughs> oh, great. And we do this by co-opting stuff suited to other areas and smashing it into this to make it the all-singing, all-dancing, it'll work everywhere method. And of course, when you use it, it doesn't work everywhere. And what people say uh, is you use the wrong bits of it. You know, you're over here, you should have been using these bits. Over there, you should have been using, but they never tell you at the beginning. So what we end up with is when it's failed, we say you use the wrong bits of the process, i.e. we start blaming the people over the process. And what's Agile all about? It's, yeah, well, we start saying the process is right, it's the people are wrong, and Agile is all about people over process. So Agile is fast becoming anti-Agile, or a cult. <laughs> One of those two. You can, you can pick either, OK? It has a particular material that it's worth. And then people say this to me, we'll do both. We'll become bimodal. Has anybody heard of bimodal? 
has anybody been foolish enough to do this? <laughs> and who's willing to admit it? Right. So back in Vitango, this is how I used to organize. There's me at the top. I used to have CIO, CFO, and different lines of business. Well, uh, business devs, ops, so forth. And we used to have lots of fights. And so I thought, well, you know, what we need to do is we need to get people together. So I built small teams. I had product owners. What do you think the net result was of that was? Yeah, more fights. <laughs> now within these teams. Okay? And I was like, well, what's going on? And then I realized that we were building some stuff which was like novel and new, and some stuff which seemed to be more core. I didn't have mapping at the time. This was about 2003, something like that. And so what I did is I split the organization and all of this into dev core, dev core, dev core, dev core, dev core. So we need two parts. What do you think the net result was? <laughs> all out warfare. <laughs> <laughs> So what was happening, and I could explain it a year later when I had mapping, is Core was building these new core services, and Dev was building new proposals on top. That stuff was evolving, and then Dev would go to Core and say, you look after this. And Core would go, where's the documentation? And they would go, burn him, heretic, blah! And so what would then happen is Dev and nothing was evolving, Dev would go and build new things on top of Dev. And so what was happening was I was getting increasing instability in this system uh, and all-out warfare between the groups because I had this missing middle. That bit in the middle, which sort of had existed before I um, basically taken my structure and polarized it, I diminished it. You either a core or Dev. There was no one in the middle. So I reorganized the entire company into chief pioneers, chief settlers, chief town planners, because I realized I need three critical types of attitude, three critical different types of people. It didn't matter whether it was engineering, marketing, finance. And so what we ended up was attitudes going across, like finance and marketing and aptitude, attitudes going up and down. So now we'd build products, product owners and small teams all with the same attitude. And then what would happen is we introduced what was known as the system of theft. So uh, the, the uh, settlers would invade the pioneering group. So the pioneers are doing something exciting. And the settlers were really good at taking exciting and making it really useful. So they would invade and steal it, forcing the pioneers to get on with more pioneering. And then the town planners, seeing the settlers' product becoming successful, would come in and steal it because the town planners were great at industrializing things. They're like the Amazons of this world, brilliant at that sort of stuff. So what we introduced was the system of theft, uh, which worked very well, and the fight stopped. Now, in order to do that, you have to, first of all, have to go through, there's about 40 pieces of doctrine, so we haven't got time. Um, but it basically, you start with a map, you break it down into small components, and then you use small teams, then you can apply multiple attitudes, and you discover that there's no such thing as one size fits all culture either, blah de blah. And it's through the system of theft that you actually manage the evolution of stuff. But we don't have time, so all I'm going to do is give a shout out to GCHQ. Uh, there's a wonderful document, it's totally available, you can go and read it yourself. Uh, uh, Boiling Frogs, you know, you'll read all about that three-party structure and how to cope with constant change, innovation, and disruption. So recap, signed off with strategy. Um, uh, where I was going, what I was going wrong. I uh, talked about the lack of maps, why maps mattered. Talked about being trapped by context. That's one of the most common problems I find. Uh, we do stuff, we don't think about why we're doing stuff because we've got no way of visualizing the context. And then we talked about some basic patterns used for anticipation and so forth. Serverless and things, get, get, uh, things we get wrong, well, we've only got a minute left, so I'll have to leave that to another day. Um, this is a cycle. The more you do it, the better you get at this. Uh, no map is a perfect representation of the space. They're all imperfect, they're all models. If I wanted to produce a perfect map of France, what scale would it be? One to one, which means it would be the size of? Which means it would be France, okay? So as a map, that's not very useful. So all maps are imperfect representations of a space, but they're great tools for learning as long as they are maps, uh, not graphs. 
All of this stuff is Creative Commons, has been for 14 years. Medium.com, Wardley Maps, there's entire communities online. We had Map Camp with about 650 mappers all over the world. Uh, all sorts of organizations are doing interesting stuff with this. Help yourself. And at that point, I'll say thank you.